That is actually true. It does. I had to change the URL, so I've got to. I've got to settle this a little. Yeah, actually, uh, one guy stopped it. I just posted, I had to change the URL, so I just posted the new one. Okay. So, yes, it would be a question. And hopefully it works. So, don't say anything you don't want preserved for eternity. <laughs> and don't say any passwords, don't post any passwords. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark. I'm one of the co-hosts, along with John Kennedy, who's on business travel in Ireland. And this morning, we have Gerald who's going to show us an exciting topic about the Configuration Manager Ansible. I'm excited. The, uh, the guest Wi-Fi is on the whiteboard in the back. And a little housekeeping note, if you would please sign next to your name on the sign-in sheet for, for the building purposes. And uh, if your name's not on here, just, just sign on the back. Thank you. Gerald? All right. Um, so, I originally had, or so I'm Gerald Dykeman. I am. I work for Red Hat. I do Ansible stuff. I'm not that good, but I'm here to talk about it anyway. Um, originally, I had designed this session to be more about network automation. I'm actually originally from Cisco, so it's a bit more of an advanced topic, and I, that was what I had in mind. But um, actually, maybe we still can do that. So I just want to pull the room to see what our Ansible knowledge is, and we can kind of be the content depending on what we have. So, uh, who uses Ansible today? Okay. Um, who's not <laughs> Who's um, who's heard of Ansible? And you're just learning more. Okay. Um, who knows how to spell Ansible? Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right. So we'll we'll actually stick with this content. So this is content I usually deliver. This is actually a six-hour workshop that I usually do. We're going to do it in two hours. So. We're going to move very fast. Um, and we're going to, uh, usually it's a hands-on lab. So what happens is I show you some stuff, everyone goes in, does stuff, and, you know, back and forth, but we're going to make it lecture-based to try to get through the content. Um, and if you have any questions throughout, just raise your hand, interrupt me, yell, whatever you want. Let's try to keep this interactive. Um, so I've never had two screens here before. This is all new, too. So I, I'll try to work with that. I mean, it's nice. Okay, so uh, we can skip that. So 
let's first talk about what Ansible is. So Ansible is an automation language. And what I mean by that is we have something called a playbook. So you use a, you use a playbook to describe how you want your infrastructure to look, whether it's a Linux host, Windows host, network, cloud, whatever you, whatever you want, you describe it in a playbook and you say, I want these things installed, I want these services running, so on and so forth, and then you go in and execute it using the automation engine. And that's all Ansible is. You define what you want, and then you execute it. And then we have something called Ansible Tower, which is sort of the management framework on top of Ansible. We won't really go into that today. Um, this is what Red Hat sells. We don't need to go into that. So, three things whenever we talk about Ansible. First, it's simple. So, like I said, I'm from the networking world. I'm from Cisco. I'm not a developer. I'm not, I never used the config management tool before Ansible. It took me about half a day to get started and actually do stuff against my routers and switches. So, very easy to get started, um, very easy to understand, and you don't have to be a developer to utilize it. Uh, another reason why it's so simple is not only because it's not actually code, it's what we call YAML syntax. It's very easy to read and understand, but it's also agentless. So when I wanted to get started with Ansible, I didn't have to go out there and install something on the node I'm going to manage just to be able to manage it. it we just SSH into the box or WinRM for uh, Windows host, and we're able to just automate that. Lastly, powerful, and powerful can mean a lot of things here. Yes, we can manage tens, hundreds, or thousands, or even tens of thousands of devices, and we have customers doing that today. But powerful in the sense that we're trying to go from automating a single process to automating a workflow. So start to bring orchestration into your environment. So let's say, let's install this or update this server, and when that server is done updating, then we have to update the database. And when that's done, then we're going to do some checks, and then we're going to do so on and so forth. So you, have this workflow rather than just trying to automate a single process. So, something called the Ansible way. Um, originally, Ansible was created as a market response to how difficult config management was. Other tools out there like Puppet and Chef um, are heavily reliant on a developer background. So out of the box, was meant for Linux host, but because it's agentless, we're able to expand to whatever we want. So very quickly, Windows support uh, on the huge uprise right now is networking support, and then we support all the clouds. So the environment I'm going to use today um, is in AWS, and I used Ansible to provision all of that. So it never went into AWS console, used Ansible to do all of it. Human readable, we use a syntax called YAML, we'll take a look at that. We also have something called dynamic inventories, and what that means is when you utilize Ansible, do I need to be in this camera? Yep. I need to be here. Oh, no. Oh, no, don't worry about it. Dynamic, so let's say, um, let's say AWS, for example. Let's say we're using Amazon. Rather than having to create a static inventory file with, let's say, 500 servers, we can query APIs to say, OK, these are the servers in my AWS environment. All right, Ansible, go do stuff against them. So you don't have to always uh, manually generate that. We can dynamically query the inventory that you're going to work against, what servers, what routers, what switches, whatever you want. Um, orchestration that plays well with others. An early use case of Ansible was actually our puppet cust not our puppet, but puppet customers that would use Ansible to deploy the puppet agents, yep. then to use puppets. So <laughs> we we play well with others. <laughs> so this is a very marketing-ish slide, but this um, some of the customers I support. This was their main use case. So they had a Windows team, they had a uh, Linux team, they had a security team, they had a network team. And all of them use different tools and all this spoke different languages. They unified it using just Ansible. So everyone is speaking now the language called Ansible. Um, and they're able to deploy much faster. So usually, if you want to deploy something, then you need to get a the developer needs to give it to you, then the server team needs to set up everything, then the network team and the security team always uh, very difficult to deal with. So all that was Ansible I, so it expedited that process. So a single language for the entire organization. Uh, and we have something called batteries included. This just means that when you install Ansible, we have, I think, 14 or 1,500 <coughs> modules, and we're, we'll go into what a module is. But it all comes with the Ansible installation. So you don't have to go out there and install, buy, whatever. All of it comes with it. So common modules out there, we have cloud modules to work with AWS, OpenStack, Microsoft Azure, uh, files to manipulate files, system stuff to install packages and whatnot, and network stuff, which is usually what I work with. But Tons of modules out there that already come. And modules help abstract the complexity away from actually doing stuff. So we'll go into what that looks like. Uh, and always for an open source tool, very strong community. 
is important. This is very outdated. Uh, it changes like every every week or so, and I gave up updating the slide. But um, t a very strong community. Uh, so a recent stat came out. I think it was Puppet, Chef, and Salt combined have less downloads than Ansible. So Ansible being a newer tool than them, it kind of speaks volumes to how much Ansible is catching on. So complete automation. Now usually the tools, they're sort of siloed into one of these uh, pieces of the pie. Ansible can sort of do it all. Um, don't try to read that in very small text. So for today's environment, what I did was I used Ansible. So what I did there was I used Ansible to first provision the infrastructure itself. So in AWS, I build the VPC, I build the subnets, I build all the networking, I build everything. And then I use Ansible to then deploy virtual machines on there. So it builds all the virtual machines, and then with that, I deploy the application. So I deploy, installed Ansible, I did all the stuff so that I can demo stuff for you today. So all that was done using Ansible, and after we're done today, I'm gonna use Ansible to tear it all down as well. So a tool that can go from instantiation of the actual infrastructure all the way to the application de deployment piece. Uh, I don't think there's another tool out there that is that uh, flexible. Okay, we don't have, well, actually, yeah, I won't demo this. So, installing Ansible is really easy. So if you're on a RHEL host or CentOS, use YAM. If you're on Debian, use AppGit. If you're on a Mac, you can just use pip install. Um, and that's it. That's all it takes. And then you have Ansible installed and you're ready to go. Usually I demo this, I forgot to uninstall Ansible. Um, but that, it's very simple, just like that. And we're not gonna So let's go into how Ansible works. So we are the users here. We're the ones that are gonna create the playbooks and define what we want our host to look like. So we're going to create these playbooks and they're written in YAML. And the playbooks have a number of tasks. So each task is going to use a module. Let's say I'm gonna use a system module to install a package. I'm gonna use a service module to enable a service. So you're gonna have all those tasks listed in your playbook. And one thing very important about Ansible is that all, all of it is executed sequential. So there's tools out there that the first run might differ from the second run, might differ from the third run. We took away that ambiguity. You define how you want it to run, it run top down. Then we have modules. Uh, this is sort of the real workhorse behind how Ansible works. <clears throat> so for example, if I'm on a RHEL or CentOS host, I would use the yum module to install packages. I would tell it what packages I want installed, what state I want them to be in, do I want it to be installed, do I no, don't want it to be installed, or do I want it to be updated in the latest version. So I can give it that state information, and it'll do whatever it needs to accordingly. Uh, plugins. It's a bit of more of an advanced topic, but it's a way to extend the capabilities of Ansible. So for example, um, I use a bunch of uh, filter plugins to be able to manipulate IP addressing schemes, because I'm, I'm a network guy. Uh, you can even manipulate how you want Ansible to respond to you. We have some nerdy stuff of um, the Mac just speaking out what Ansible's doing. We also use the plugin to be able to manipulate Philips Hue light bulbs. So many ways you can use plugins to uh, extend the capabilities of Ansible, but slightly uh, more complex topic. But, all right, so this is our inventory. So this is a statically generated inventory. So, so for example here, we have two groups. We have a web and a DB group. So this is how we would actually write our inventory. We say, all right, Ansible target my web group and do this. Or Ansible target my DB group and do this. What Ansible will do is you go in and look at the host underneath it and it'll do what it needs to do. Or actually Ansible just target this guy. So you can define who you want to target and this is what we call host in our playbook so we'll go into that but that's an inventory file. Oops. And of course dynamic inventory. Uh, we can query OpenStack, AWS, satellite, you name it. We, have a, we most likely have an inventory, dynamic inventory script for it so you can pull that information in. So here's an example of some uh, commonly used modules. So for packaging, apt and yum, uh, for file manipulation, for copying stuff over if you wanted to. And an interesting one here is wait for. So let's say we need to uh, do a rolling update. So we have to update first our applications. We have to first update our database server. So we update it. We say, Ansible, go update that. Then we say, all right, actually wait for the database server to come back. So we're, we're pulling that server. All right, is it back? All right, now go ahead and update the application server. So we can use wait for it to be able to do that 
time to update it, make sure some parameter is satisfied before we move on. And we're going to use it, I'm going to show you an example of this, this ping module. Um, this is not an ICMP ping. So everything here, how Ansible works, it's a Python script being executed on the host that you're managing. So when we use the ping module, it's actually going to the host, dropping a Python script, and the host is going to reply back with a pong. So everything here is Python, there's no, this is not a real ICMP ping. Uh, extensive documentation. So one of the better documented open source tools out there, everything you need to know from what the module is, what parameters it takes, and how to actually put it in your playbook. So all that is documented in um, the Ansible documentation, and we also have a command line form that I never use. All right, so I think this is the last time before we actually go into showing something. We have something called run commands. So we always want to use a module. The module has a lot of logic built into it so that it can error handle, it can accept your parameters, it can understand state, meaning that is it satisfied or not. If there isn't a module, there's still a way to automate, and we have these run commands. So think of it as you're actually on the box itself and you're typing in the commands. So I'm gonna show you an uptime command, but if you're actually there, you're typing out the commands, there is no way to error handle, there is no additional logic because we're simply connected to the box and doing the stuff as if we were connected to that box and on that host. So ways to get around modules not existing, you're welcome to write a module and push it up, or you can use these modules here, sort of the fallback modules to still automate. Uh, raw is just pure SSH commands over, so there's no bash, there's no Python, it's just raw, it's just connecting and doing stuff. This is what I used to use early on when um, there weren't good network modules. So always way to get around um, modules not existing. Okay, so let's talk about inventory real quick. So in an inventory we can have we're going to define our groups that are going to have hosts underneath it. Uh, you can have variables per inventory, and they can be static or dynamic. So here's an example of a very bad inventory. Uh, please don't do that. You're going to go crazy. <laughs> Give it some more human meaningful stuff like this. So let's see, all right, this is my control group. The, the host name is this, and here's how you actually connect to it. Here's my web group. This is a little pretty way of doing it, but we have node one, two, three, and here's my actual host to actually reach it. And then we have variables. So this is saying variables for all my groups. This is saying, so whenever you connect to any of these boxes, you're going to connect as the, as the user vagrant, and you're going to use this SSH key pop. So you can put a password here if you wanted. And there's ways to encrypt this so it's not in plain text, but this would just be a way to define variables for the host you connect to. OK, add out commands. A very easy way to get started without actually writing a playlist. So we're going to start here. Um, let me. So, I am disconnected. Okay. So before we get started with add-on commands, the first thing is when you install Ansible, it's going to create an Ansible configuration file at etsy ansible ansible.config. So actually, the screen's much better, so you can actually read it. Um, but this is where you define the, the default behavior of Ansible. Most of the time, you're not going to edit much here, except for maybe the ports and what, where your inventory lives. So this is saying Ansible, whenever you run something, Here's where my inventory is. So use that inventory file to run stuff. Or, in our case, we can also modify the forks. So this is saying, Ansible, I want you to only touch five nodes at a time. So if you had a list of 100 servers, we're saying, Ansible, do it in chunks of five. So you can raise that to whatever you want, the limit being memory. So we expect for about four gigs for every 100 nodes you want to manage, and also your blast radius, too. Do you really want to touch 1,000 devices at a time? You don't want to, probably don't want to. So tweak the forks according to what you want. So that's the Ansible configuration file. That's the default location. So Ansible will always, yeah. Is that something that you can change just on the fly for some specific commands and override the, what's in the config file? Could you give me an example of what you want to override? Uh, uh, let's say on a regular basis, I want to deploy patches on so many machines, but mm -hmm. uh, let's say I have a, 
know, an emergency brake fix to the void. I want to make sure that it's going faster than usual. Okay. That's a way to uh, yeah, there is. something just by a command, an option. And um, so here, let me let me show you the other part. So um, the Ansible configuration file can live in many places. So that's the default location. You can have an Ansible config for project, or you can have an Ansible config in your home directory, and they'll take precedence. So you can have different Ansible configs everywhere. Okay. So in our case, this is the Ansible configuration file that I'm using. I'm saying, so I, I define these, everything else is the default value that's in the normal file. So I'm saying use connection smart, figure Ansible, you figure out the connection type, give it a timeout, but more importantly, I'm saying, here is where my inventory lives. So Ansible, whenever I run a command, target that inventory file. So I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. <clears throat> And this is in my home directory. So this will take precedence over the default. In my current directory, if I have an ansible.config, that will take precedence. So you can have it per project, per whatever you want, and you can have those ansible. Yes? Related to that, this is something I've been wondering for a while, is how effective would you think it is, rather than installing ansible, use it in a container? Meaning that, that you're, you're running a Docker container with your ansible prep already in there, ready to go all the time. Is there any reason that you would consider that not a good thing to do? Obviously, it's in the connectivity and all. So. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a perfectly viable way of using it. So the control host can live anywhere, right? Whether it's a container or a VM or a bare metal machine. Yeah. So whatever is easiest for you uh, would work. I don't think I understood the question. I mean, there's... Oh, rather, really than, installing Ansible, rather than installing Ansible on your machine, run an Ansible in oh, container yeah. from an image. Now, I saw an interesting example of something that Ansible did in the reference architecture for OpenShift recently, and that was rather than having Ansible direct SSH to the nodes, it was going via run command in AWS, SSM run command. So instead of actually executing SSH commands, it was executing them using run commands, and that allows you then to use the tags and groups and so on within your AWS instances, again, without you having direct access to it. Yeah. Anyway, that was just an so, interesting approach. There, yeah, that's so. I'm not a developer, so I don't do OpenShift much. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many ways to do that. That's one way. You can also yeah. have a bastion host or a jump host yeah. that Ansible can execute through to go through. And a lot of our customers do that because of security reasons. So, for example, in AWS, you don't want to open up all the ports so that your machine on premise needs to access it. So, you have a jump host in AWS if it has the same networking, so you can just go ahead and use it. So, there's many ways to use Ansible, and certainly a container is one of more up and coming popular ways of doing that. Um, yeah, so that's the inventory file. Did someone else have a question? I think. Yeah. I'm curious, just trying to understand the process. It goes from the project to the home directory to the system. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay, so let's take a look at what that inventory file looks like. So here's our inventory file that we're using. So we're telling Ansible, whatever you connect, connect as student one. Here's the password I want. Here's the password I want you to use. Um, obviously, in clear text, super secure. <laughs> and here's the port I want you to use. So all of this, this sensitive information can be encrypted. So I'm going to show you that if we have time, we have something called Ansible Vault to encrypt sensitive information, so it's not in clear text. But that's what we're saying. Whenever you connect to any of my nodes, that's the variables I want you to use. You can also have variables per group. So I can have a web vars, I can have a control vars, and that will apply just to that group. You can also have host level variables. So you can have variables per specific host. So if I just put variables along this line, that's variables that apply to that host. So in this case, node one, node two, node three, that's the host name that we're giving it. And here's a variable I want it to use. Ansible host is this. That's a variable we're passing in for that node. Okay, so let's run some stuff. So let's say, all right, Ansible, this is add-on commands. We're starting with add-on commands. So we're not actually using a playbook, we're just running commands on the fly. We're gonna say, here's the module, dash M to say, here's the module I want you to use, and I'm gonna use the ping module to see if my nodes are up. So who do I wanna target in my inventory? I can target all of them, I can target just the web group, I can target the control group, let's just target everybody. So it came back, um, we got a Pong, this is saying that, hey, we have connectivity to the device, it responded. Let me run that again. So you can see here, the first run, we actually had node one, three, two, and then Ansible come back. Second, we have one, two, three. So this is because Ansible runs in parallel. Remember, our forks is five, so it defaults to five. So it goes out to all the five nodes. In our case, it's only four nodes. Comes back, whatever comes back first, it'll display it. It'll, it'll give it to us in that order. 
in this case it came back pretty, but the previous one it was node one. So whatever comes back first, because we're uh, running in parallel. Let's do another module. So um, let's use the yum module. To, now we have to give it an argument. All right, what are we actually installing? So let's say name equals HTTPD and state equals late, for example. So what we're saying here is I want to use the yum module, and here's the package I want you to install, and here's the state I want you to be at. So Ansible is a desired state tool, so whatever state we define is what Ansible is going to try to match. So if I put state present, it's just going to check if a patch is installed. If I put state latest, it's going to make sure it's the latest version. I can also put absent to make sure that package is not on the system, to use the state for that. Now, one other thing we're going to do, so in this, this time we're going to target just the web group in our inventory, our three nodes there, and we have to do something called dash b. So dash b means become, and it means elevate privileges. So Ansible, when you execute this command, we have to elevate privileges because we're doing a system level thing. So go ahead and elevate privileges. So. Does it matter where that dash b is? It does not. Okay. It actually does. So hopefully that works. I haven't done the, the Linuxy stuff in a while. I've been doing only network stuff. I, I just know that you have to say web dash b not that because it's not like that. Oh, this is for the entire execution. Um, okay, so really ugly text comes back, <laughs> but we have it installed. Now, what's going to happen is if I run this again, we're going to have achieved our desired state, so it's going to say everything's good. Comes back green. Nothing to do. Um, that's why it's safe to run Ansible many, many times against your infrastructure, and that's one of the use cases for security and compliance. We have customers that have a security playbook that they constantly run against their infrastructure to make sure no one went in there and did stuff they didn't need to, and their systems are in compliance state. So let's go ahead and now remove that. So let's say, all right, state, actually, what I want is absent. I just want to make sure uh, a patch is not installed on this. So when I did that, it recorded a change, yellow means change, and if we run it again, it's going to say, hey, yum isn't installed on there. We're already good to go. So we'll just go ahead and move on. Right? Different from blindly pushing scripts through, we understand the state, and so it goes and compares the state, make sure it needs to change or doesn't need to change, and then just moves on if it doesn't need to change. OK, so let's do one more. In this case, let's use the command module. And this is, if there isn't a module, this is how we can fall back and still execute commands. We can still automate stuff using the command module. So in this case, we'll just say, all right, what's the uptime? And uh, we'll target the web group. And I think that's it. So it says, OK, so here's the uptime. This is as if I was on the box and I typed uptime, right? Same information I'm getting back. Now, you can quickly do this and query it. And maybe dash O is to pretty it up. That's supposed to be a one-liner, but just one line, you can feed it into a file and make sure all your systems are up and running and you can have a status of what's going on. So, add-on commands. Any questions on add-on commands? All right, very simple. Yes? Can any user do the dash b command? Or does that have to be a certain group? So, that would depend on, first of all, the variables you define. So, if any user can come in here and use Ansible, Right? And that's kind of where Ansible Tower comes in, but I'm not here to do a, a pitch on a product. Um, but that's where you can have control. So one of the difficulties with just Ansible command line is, how do you limit control of who gets to do what? And that's where you need an enterprise tool to manage who gets to do what. But yeah, at, there's, no, there's no way to stop someone from doing that if they have packages and stuff. OK, so that was a long way of talking about what had Oh, I forgot to show you this. OK, so we have. One Some, question. When you like add hoc commands, does it have to be in a in an inventory or can you add hoc point at an IP address as well? We always have to have an inventory file we target. Okay. And so we'll need an inventory file. And that inventory file could be blank. So in this case, um, I'm targeting something that's not even in my in inventory file. So I'm gonna target something called localhost. It's just a construct in Ansible saying myself. So I'm gonna run the setup module on myself. So whenever you run a playbook, this runs by default. And I'll show you what that is. It's a 
whole bunch of information about the node you're about to touch. So in this case, and we have all this information here, uh, one of the common use cases that I have for this is, So, there, so these are all variables that get populated. So you can actually use this as conditional logic, saying, oh, is the memory you know, up there? Then maybe we need to kill some services. Or is the CPU throttled? Or in my case, I use it for um, checking the distribution. Is it Red Hat? Is it Ubuntu? Is it Windows? And I have a playbook that goes out there and updates any OS. Right? And I use this, use this information Ansible gives me to program that in. So I say, if I'm targeting Red Hat, and the distribution is seven or higher, then do these tasks to update it. If it's less than seven, if it's six and below, maybe do some other stuff. If it's an Ubuntu machine, then do this stuff and use app instead of yum to install it. And if it's a Windows, then Windows. Um, so that's the setup module. So all of this is now available to you in your playbook to then use as logic to do additional stuff. So it's a ton of information that comes back. All right. Usually I get a break here so people start typing stuff and just keep going. <laughs> All right, variables, let's talk about variables. So command line parameters, so when we said um, dash B, that is actually a variable I passed in saying the cup, saying elevate privileges please. You can have other variables, you can override other variables you might have, I'll show you that um, once we get a little deeper. You can have variables within your playbook and, or your tasks, you can have it as files, you can import files as your variables that has a whole bunch of stuff that you need to use. It can live in your inventory, right? We said all of ours, this is the user I want you to connect as, this is the password I want you to use. This is the setup module, discovered facts. We can use those variables, or we can, something called rules that we probably won't touch today. Uh, and because we have so many ways to bring in variables, we have a variable precedence, tree, that you don't have to memorize. Extra bars is command line variables. This will override everything. Uh, that sounds scary. You, you, you would control that. Um, most likely we're playing here. This is where the variables we define. Is it on the host level? Is it on the group level? Is it on the playbook level? So just keep in mind that we have this variable precedence so that if you're stepping on uh, other variables, you, you, you can always visit this and see what, what's going on. Okay, so tasks. So within a playbook, we're gonna have a number of tasks. So these are some common uh, modules that are utilized. We're gonna go into what a template is, but yum for packaging service for make sure a service is running or not running, or make sure it's stopped, stuff like that. So example tasks in a play. Okay, so here's an example snippet of a playbook. So we say, can you, can you read that in the back? Oh, man. <laughs> I wanted to fit the whole thing in here. Okay, let's just go like this. All right, that'll work. So we're saying, we'll, we'll give it a name, right? So how we want to use Ansible is treat it like documentation itself. It's already really easy to use. We also want to make it easier to use for other people that are going to use your playbooks that you write. So give it a name. So we're saying, all right, make sure Apache's present. Use the YUM module, make sure Apache's at the latest state. Okay, that's great. Uh, then let's go down to the copy module. So in this case it says, use the copy module to copy this file over to that destination. And lastly we say, use the service module to restart the Apache service. Now, can anyone tell me what is wrong with this playbook, or this, this task list? Why would you not write it this way, other than getting fired? Restarting TCP every time. You yes, start. exactly. So these states, do you use Ansible? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so these states can be achieved. So when I connect to a box and I say, hey, is Apache installed at the latest state? Yes, move on. Is this file there? Yes, then move on. Is the service restarted? No, not yet until I restart it, so I'm going to restart it. <laughs> so if you write it like this, it's going to restart Apache every time and people are not going to be happy. So don't write it like that. So to combat something like that, we have something called a handler. Now, what is a handler? In this case, let's say, now we have a notify. So we say, all right, if this task records a change, then no send this, shoot this notification off. And now a handler is gonna look for those notifications. Uh, it's really hard back. 
So remember the name up here? It says restart HTTPD. That name is important. That's how the handler is going to recognize it. So now we have a handler section that says, hey, was this notification shot off? If it was, then go ahead and restart the service. All right, so if, if that recorded a change, shoot off the hand, uh, shoot off the notification, and the handlers will pick that up and do stuff if it requires it. So that's how you would avoid uh, restarting a patch every time. So a couple points on handlers. Like everything in Ansible, it's not the order that the notifications are sent, it's the order that's defined in your handler section that determines how your handlers run. So it doesn't matter if, um, does that make sense? I think I, so let's say we had, let's say, you list the handlers first, is that? No, no, so you define your handlers here. So let's say you wanna make sure Apache's restarted before something else, before something else. You define it in your handler section, not in the order it's notified. So you have control over what gets done first and, uh, or last. Secondly, you can have one notification, 10, 100, 1,000. Handlers run once at the end of the playbook execution. So this is run last. After everything's done, then it checks the notifications. For any of these notified hits, then it does the task that it needs to. So just a couple points on handlers. Any questions on handlers? Okay, so let's talk about a playbook. So this is a more complete playbook. So we say, once again, we always like to use good documentation. So we say, here's the name of my playbook. Here's the host I want to target. So in our inventory file, remember we had a control group, a web group, or we can even say all, like we did on Anna command. So you can define who you want to target here. The come yes is the dash B. So in this playbook, we're saying you have to elevate privileges. Here's a variable we don't use, but here's a way to define a variable. You can even prompt the user for a variable if you wanted to uh, during your playbook execution. So now we're saying the same stuff. We're saying, all right, make sure Apache's installed, make sure the file's copied over, and make sure that the service is started. All right, these are all states that we can achieve, and it won't force anything to happen if it's not. Um, so human meaningful naming, uh, they, I guess they break it all down. But we all we know all that stuff now. Okay, so let me go into a demo of that. So everything I'm using here, by the way, it's online uh, in our GitHub repository. So if you wanted to revisit this, uh, these slide decks will also be available. I guess I'll send it to someone to post it on Meetup. But let's go into an example here. Okay, so here's the plan we're going to run. So it says. This is what we were seeing the whole time. Give it a name, give it the host we're targeting. Yeah, please elevate privileges. Here's our list of tasks. Spacing is very important. It's similar to Python. Space indentation is how you define what's what. So our first, and it's just a bunch of lists. So the first list we're sending in is playbook level variables. So here's the name of the playbook, here's the host, here's become yes, and here's our tasks. So within the task section, then we can give it a list of more things. So the first task is to use yum to do that. Second task is to use the copy and do that, and so on and so forth. So because yum needs parameters, then you indent again, and these are parameters for the yum module. And these are parameters for the copy module. And these are parameters for the service module, so on and so forth. So spacing is very important. Um, luckily, we're not doing a workshop, because you would experience that firsthand. <laughs> so let's go ahead and run that playbook. So Ansible playbook, site.yum. Now if I, yes? Assume it doesn't matter whether it's tabs or spaces. Uh, try to keep it spaced. It shouldn't matter, but because you want to share it, you want to keep it as spaced. We do two spaces as sort of the convention to do uh, Ansible indentation. But yes, you could use tabs, it's not recommended. Is that? You don't like tabs? What are they? <laughs> I mean, you can edit that in your Vim or whatever RC or whatever config file to say a tab is four spaces or two spaces if you wanted to. Um, but convention is just two spaces that we try to promote. So everyone's writing in the same one. But you can use tabs. Just make sure it's all tabbed correctly and then it'll work just fine. So if I didn't have an inventory file defined in my Ansible configuration file, I would say dash i and my inventory is this. So I would, I would tell it what inventory to use. But we have it defined, so we don't have to do that in our Ansible config. 
Alright, regardless, let's go ahead and run the playbook. So gathering facts. This is the setup module running. And so it's going out to the nodes and getting all the facts about the modules, although we don't use any of it. And you can turn that off. Uh, you can turn off gathering facts. So gather facts no in your playbook. That would turn it off. What's the advantage of doing that? Yeah, faster, faster execution. Because we actually have to go to the query step to bring facts. Um, so you can just do, uh, in here you could have done gather facts no. Hopefully that didn't break it. So we skipped the gather facts part now and just went through it. So the second run, everything's okay, right? The first run we recorded a bunch of changes. The second run we didn't because we achieved that too. So that's an example of playbook execution. Any questions? Okay. Uh, uh, question? Yes. Uh, is there a way by default to keep logs of everything that's done with Ansible so that way we can monitor that someone has been doing this or that in mm -hmm. proper way? No. And that's where <laughs> we sell Ansible Tower for all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. So that, that stuff will be there. Of course, there's ways you can feed all the output into a file if you wanted to. Very hard to parse, though. Very hard to parse. Um, and especially when you want this. So let me do. So these events show up in Sysmo? Uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. And as you, as you connect, you're connecting with your SSH key, so you do see the connected uh, in the SSH key. Yeah. So there, there is a way that. One thing I didn't see in Byte Loop was uh, there was no um, initial connect SSH only the dots. Was there anything to that connect? Um, yes, so that was did you in. See when we weren't looking, or is there some switch to turn to more? Yeah, post key checking fault. So I turned that off because we want to automate it and not say yes to all the nodes we're connected to. So you can. Thank you. I just know that exists. Yeah, you can just go ahead and do host key checking fault. Okay, so. Like this is very hard to parse. So with with Ansible Tower it gives you gives it to you in structured data so you can reference it more easily. With the command line you can also do it. So if we do a so dash V is verbosity, more information you want back. So if we go up to at least three V's, we start to get back structured data of what's going on. So we can start to reference stuff in a prettier way. Um, Although this is still pretty ugly, but at least it's in structured data form. So if you raise it up to three verbosities, you're going to start to get more output back. Uh, three Vs is to usually troubleshoot SSH stuff. So all that blue stuff you saw up here, that's all SSH information. So if you're having problems, you can raise the verbosity and start troubleshooting. And of course, Windows, five Vs. Because uh, Windows. <laughs> um, so doing more with playbooks. We won't be going really fast. Um, do you have any questions? I had a comment on the host key checking, and that was something that you can do is if you're launching instances from the, the Ansible control node, create the key that you want to use to be the unique each time in the user data during the launch. Populate them the key there in the, in the, the, the nodes you're launching so that the control node can still use key access to get to them. And that, that works very well. So anyways, just a comment. I think... Um, I think he was also talking about how you want to accept the fingerprint when you first SSH the new file. Yeah, my, my, my big use case, or one of my use cases, I use it as a lot more at all. I'll burp a host, and then I put it to a sync state with all the defaults that I use to change before I start working on whatever file I have. Okay. If you put it in the authorized keys, yeah, by right. the way, at would, launch time, you won't have to do that except it'll just run there right from the start. Connects, it, it works well. Now, I definitely, positively, you can do it so that you don't have to have uh, the acknowledgement on it. That you can populate the nodes being launched with the account, the authorized, create the authorized key with the key, and, and that'll keep you from having to do that. Right. This, is, this isn't an AWS. It's just no. A, uh, work. So, yeah, yeah that, that would be yeah. the most elegant. Elegant, yeah. yeah. Elegant, yeah, that's the nice <laughs> elegant way to do it. If not, you can just ignore it and still be able to Thank go you. in there <clears throat> without manual intervention. Okay. Doing more with playbooks. So, am I going too fast? No, no, it's good. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> just 
talking straight without making you guys type is really, really difficult. Um, so let's go into a couple other things. So first we have something called templates. Now what we used was the copy module to copy an uh, index.html over to the destination. Now that's a static copy. Whatever is being copied, that's what's going to be sent over. We have something called templates, and it uses Jinja2 templating. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to dynamically inject variables during execution and then copy that over. So if you're modifying config files, let's say per device, you might have different config files per device, maybe interface configurations or whatever else you do. Um, you can dynamically inject variables to tweak how that config file will look and then just send that over. So let me give you an example <coughs> of a config file that we're actually going to use. <coughs> so in here, this is the, we're going to deploy we're going to deploy a uh, web server. And in here it says Apache test message. So that I'm actually referencing a variable there and then injecting that into my HTML file. So what is it? Apache test message. In my playbook, oh god, in my playbook, I say this is Apache test message. So it's going to take this variable at execution time and it's going to populate my HTML file with that. Another thing here called inventory hostname. So inventory hostname is a construct in Ansible that says <clears throat> when I connect to node one. The inventory host name is node one. That variable gets populated. When I connect to node two, this is the inventory host name. So we're sending over what web message to display, <clears throat> but we're also specifying what node we're on. So we're, we're injecting that in at runtime. <coughs> Any questions on templates? So not to not to um, <clears throat> go off topic, but. <laughs> but we're going off topic. Um, so networking world, here's a common template I use. So one of the things, and you don't have to understand what all that stuff is, but how I configure, <clears throat> just think about VPN. How I configure VPN is going to be, on, on my Cisco devices, is going to be the same. right? The commands are going to be the same no matter what. What's different is the IP addressing. What's different is the maybe the password and so on. So I variableize all of that. And I, so th I use this to configure you know, 10, 20 routers at a time. It uses the same template and I inject different variables for each router. So now I can do that very easily. So templating becomes very powerful. The more you utilize it, the more you use Ansible, you're going to start to lean on templating a lot. But this is a way that I standardize how I configure my routers, and I just inject, inject different variables. And doing a, a Cisco router is tough. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I know this stuff; these terms don't make sense, but um, or maybe it does. And That's a lot of work savings. There. <laughs> <laughs> but this helps. So, oh, here we can look at a filter too. So I have a loopback network that I define, and I pass in as a variable, and this is a filter. So I'm filtering it through this fil ginger filter called IP adder. So I can do IP address manipulation using the IP adder. So in this case, I'm saying, give it the IP of, I have a variable called site as well. So let's just say IP adder two means give me the second IP of that sub. And then I, I filter it again. I say, oh, give me just the address piece because it's a, let's say 10.1.1.1 slash 24. Just give me only the address and give me the, just the network because that's how Cisco takes the command. Um, so that's an example of a filter. I, I use the IP adder filter to manipulate the IP addressing so that I can use it um, across any device and run the same template. Are they, are they truly using that model? Yes. Are so, yeah, so any curly brace you see is a variable. So I'm, I have to manipulate it quite a number of times. Is, is there also a version that's turned together? Or is that a, yeah, so there's three different variables. So. Mm -hmm. So th yeah, so there's multiple curly braces. So this is a variable, then this is a variable, so on and so forth. So there's multiple variables there. Thank you. Okay. Right, templates. So that's templates. Um, loops. Very standard. We can now loop through stuff. So in this case, we're saying use the yum command or yum module. 
here's the list of items that I want. This can live in here, or you can have a list of packages that you want to find somewhere else. And basically we're just saying, go ahead and just loop through it. First run, it's gonna use this, second run, use this, so on and so forth. So just standard loops. Um, you can have loops of loops and do crazy stuff, but you know, we all understand loops. Conditional, so this is where uh, we're using the setup module to get this information back from the uh, device and then use that as conditional logic to then execute that. So if we're targeting Red Hat, use Yum. If we're targeting Debian, then use App, so on and so forth. So let me show you another playbook. If you use, if you use uh, conditional like that, when you have setup module turn off, it fails. It just doesn't use the cache value, right? Yeah, so yeah. It won't, it won't find that variable, so we'll just skip that yeah. path. Um, I think you'll skip. Let's skip it. Well, actually, this variable is going to look to see if this variable is. I don't know. Let's test it. <laughs> Let me test it real quick. Um, so let's get rid of all this. And let's just say when for the ants will understand. And we'll, we'll disable gather facts. Yeah, it looks like um, angry bear. I think this is wrong. It told me not to do stuff live. Whatever. Well, yeah, it looks like it's gonna fail. But um, oh yeah, I was gonna show you playbook stuff. But an example would be so I have a playbook that updates all uh, distributions, well, four distributions. So rel, the way you update and check for restart on rel seven and higher is different from how you check it on rel six. So actually, let me show you one more thing before I go into that because we have one more topic. Uh, two more. So tags, you can use tags to tag your tasks, tag your tasks. Uh, so when I run my playbook, I can say only run the ones with the tag of package, or only run the ones with tag of configuration, only run the ones with baseline, whatever you want. So you can tag your stuff and do specific ones, or do everything but these tags, or tags. So you can do both. Only do these tags, or do everything but these tags. You can do both, uh, both logic there. Wait, this is one. Okay. So blocks. So in this case, we have a block of code or block of YAML stuff. So we're saying everything in here will run when this conditional logic is met. <clears throat> so you can start to use blocks to do that. So you start to block, and um, that's how I sort of wrote the playbook, but you block, here's the set of things I want you to do, and here's the conditional, if that's met, run this block of code. Now block can also be used for error handling. So you can have a block and then you can have a rescue. So if anything in here fails, jump into my rescue clause and execute those. So maybe roll back stuff, maybe clean up after yourself, or maybe just whatever it is, you can have a rescue clause to do so. And you can also have an always clause, so always run this. So block, rescue, and always. All right, so. In this case, I have a block. My first block is on make sure the OS family is Red Hat and make sure the distribution is seven. So I do that. Next block is for anything with less than seven, the distribution. So I, I need the setup module in this case. I need it to go query those variables for me or this playbook won't work. The next one is for Debian. And lastly, Windows. <laughs> Reboot is required. <laughs> Um, oh, always required. So, anyway, is there anyone like that loads Windows? I'll stop bashing on Windows. <clears throat> um, so blocks. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the playbook now. All right, so here's the playbook that we're going to run. And actually, I should just show you. So, same thing, give it a name. What host are we targeting? We're targeting our web group in our inventory. Become yes means elevate privileges. 
now we have a set of variables we're defining. So this is our list of packages that we want to install because we're going to use a loop. Here's the variable that we're injecting into our template, right, using the templating engine. And here's a variable for the server port. Okay, so let's look at the task. It says, ensure that Apache is present. We're going to use a loop here. So it's referencing HTTPD packages, which is this here. So we're just referencing that here. And we're saying item is just the default name for <coughs> the, the item when you're looping through. And you can change what the variable is. This is the default. It's called item. So it's going to go and install Apache, then install this. If you have more, it'll do whatever else. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that with some modules, such as yum, we don't want the yum module to execute twice. So if there is a loop, we send over all the packages at one time, and then we execute the yum module once. But other modules, if you use this loop, we'll just go ahead and do it, you know, execute that five, six, seven times, <coughs> depending on the module you use. Okay, and then we're gonna notify. So we say, hey, if, if we actually have to have a change to Apache, then go ahead and notify so that my handler can restart the server. Next, we're going to use the file module to create a directory. A file module can create a directory, it can delete a directory, you can create a file, delete a file. And within the file module family, we also have other modules such as line in file. So we can actually read into a file and make sure a certain set of text exists. So maybe in your Etsy host, you need to make sure that this line is there. So you can use the line in file to go ahead and configure your Etsy host to make sure that this host lives there. Or make sure that this host doesn't live there. So on and so forth. Uh, so that's the file module. Then we have our template module here. So template is a superset of the copy. So underneath the scenes, template runs it through the Jinja2 templating engine. It populates all the variables, and we just copy it over. And so it's just twofold. So template for the Apache configuration file. If this if this records a change, then obviously we have to restart Apache for it to pick up the new configuration. So we shoot off a notification. Template for our splat, our web page that's going to be displayed. This is where we inject our test message and we inject our inventory host name. So we'll take a look at that. Use the service module to make sure that Apache started. Enabled yes means persist through reboot. So we're making sure that it also persists through reboot. And then we have our handlers at the bottom saying, if, if this notification gets fired off, please go ahead and restart Apache. <coughs> Any questions? Pretty easy to understand, right? It's really easy, that's why I'm up here. Um, so let's go ahead and run that. Um, and is there anything on screen to explain? Okay, so. Okay, so it goes out there, gather the facts, make sure those uh, packages are there, use the file module to create a directory, copy it over to config and index, and make sure that Apache was started. So if we run it again, everything should be green because we hit our desired state. Now, um, if we take a look at our web node, we're going to see that this is the Apache test message we passed in. This is a test message. And it's really hard to see, but it says node 1 down here. So if we went to node 2, it'd say node 2 down here, because that's the inventory host name and the inventory file that is injected. So <clears throat> let's take a look at um, let's take a look at manipulating this. So we're going to use an extra variable now. So dash e means So dash e means extra var. Okay, so what do, what do I want my extra var to be? Well, this is now going to be uh, Nova Love. This is Nova Love, right? I'm from Raleigh, so. Um, so now we're overriding that variable with that. So everything else should still okay out. We're just going to see a change in index.html because now we have to change the message that gets displayed. 
we refresh that, and then see, okay, so we went ahead, it injected that variable into the new template, went ahead and passed it through, so now we have a different web message display. So that was command line parameter of injecting a variable to override what's in the playbook. So that's where the variable precedence matters. Any questions? I have a question. It does seem to be very vulnerable when you expect the Enterprise Edition to solve that. And if the user could sort of find that you know, simply either using the manual and doing integrity tests. Um, you know what? We can actually go into that interface too. And but the main thing is, give me one second. Let me turn on my uh, node. Actually, you can even see this. So I'm, I'm, I have a bunch of playbooks. And this playbook is for when questions like that come up. So I can just turn on my node real quick. I give it a tag of start tower. Uh, and it's going to go in there and just run the piece to start tower. So, so it just required AWS APIs to go turn on my node in AWS. So let me show you what that playbook looks like actually. And I'm gonna answer your question. I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm always all over the place. Uh, so in my, <clears throat> in my playbook, first of all, I'm talking AWS, so there's no, okay, actually there's multiple concepts. Here. So first, my host is localhost. So when you talk to AWS, you're sending over API calls. So you're not SSHing to AWS. There's no such, you can't SSH to AWS, whatever that even means. So in this case, we're saying execute these locally, and then the APIs that, API calls that get generated, send that to AWS. So that's why we're doing local. Same thing for networking. You can't just install agents on network equipment. <clears throat> Cisco won't let you do that. Um, so we execute the module locally, and then send over the appropriate command. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's why we're doing local. In this case, since we're working with the cloud. Gather facts, no, obviously we're not gonna gather facts. So we're saying, here's the nodes that I have in um, AWS that I utilize. All I did was, oh, you have to give it the um, AWS region and subnet so it understands, and I use that as a variable here. So I'm saying, all right, EC2 modules, since we're working with AWS, that's the region I want you to go into. Here's the subnet I need you to use, and I want you to make sure that my tower, my tower node is running, is in the state of running. And I pass in the tag of start tower. That's why I did the playbook with dash T start tower. Now, if, after I'm done, I go ahead and do the opposite, and I put in a tag of stop tower, and it's gonna make sure that instance is now stopped. So that's what that playbook was. So if we take a look at it, um, we went ahead and recorded a change. If I play it again, it should say that it's already up. It's already up and running. So, And we will go into tower. Actually, Peter told me, don't go into tower because it's not a product pitch, but I mean, it'll be useful to still look at. Um, and you don't have to buy it. Uh, so that's mainly it. So, so if we take a look at how we use Ansible thus far, <clears throat> and I need to time this better. It's only been an hour, huh? We're almost done. Um, so you're almost Ansible gurus already. So, if we take a look at how we used Ansible today, or so far, we had a file that had the user, the password, and the nodes you connect to. We also had all the playbooks there. So someone could actually manipulate the playbook and do some bad stuff if they wanted to. So having control over that is very difficult with just command line, and that's where a product like this comes in. And this is, all, this is also open source, so it's called um, AWX and GitHub, so you can just install this in a container, and you can have power. Um, so for example, first we're going to, first we're going to, um, I don't want to make this a product. <laughs> so we're gonna have users and teams in Ansible Tower. So you start to divvy out, all right, who gets to do what? So I'm gonna have these users, they might, you might have one for the Linux team, one for the Windows team, because each team can have access to different inventories. So you see the Linux team can only touch the Linux machines, the Windows team, team can only touch the Windows machines or this public cloud, public cloud team can only touch AWS, for example. So you start to limit that. Now, other stuff that come with it is where we start to have control. So first we control who gets to even log into this, and then we control who gets to use what credential, 
So what credentials are you allowed to use to log into the box? So depending on what system level permission you give that user, you're going to manage that here in the credential section. Um, so in my case, for example, when I work with AWS, here's my access key, here's my secret key, it's encrypted, right? you can't get it out, so all these security measures we build, we build into uh, the product. So we have credentials now. Who gets to use what credentials to log into the node? Who gets access to what inventory so that they can actually log into those nodes? Next, we have um, control over the playbooks. So usually you would use some type of source control, whether it's Git or Subversion or whatever you want to use. So in our case, we're saying, all right, here's the repository with all my playbooks, and I can give it permission. Say, only the Linux team can use these playbooks, and then you'll have a different set of Windows playbooks. Now what that does is, you can't modify playbooks in here. Right, so that playbook is however you write it in your source control. Now, if they go into source control and edit it, then you need to look at your permissions and not let them do that. Um, and most people aren't better. And now what they can do here is they can only execute the playbook <coughs> that you give them access to. So now you have control over who gets to run Ansible, who gets to use what playbook and only that playbook, and it's gonna run the way we've, program, uh, we've written it. And then your inventories, Right, who gets to access what inventory? And then your actual templates. So in this case, what I do is I have a template that says, all right, here's the name. The job type is run. So there's two job types. You can actually have a run and a check. So if we go here, you can have a check mode, and you can do this on the command line as well. So when you do Ansible playbook, and you do dash dash check, it's going to run the playbook and tell you what would have changed if you ran it. So if you want to do that before you actually run the playbook to make sure that everything's in order and this is what you're expecting, you can always do that. But we just run in production. Network inventory. Um, so we say, all right, here's the job type. Here's the inventory that you're going to use. Here's the project, the repository. Here's the actual playbook that you're going to utilize. Here's the credentials, forks. Remember, this is how many nodes we want Ansible to touch at one time. We didn't talk about limit, but limit is a way to limit the inventory you're targeting. So when we target our web group, for example, let's say we're targeting our web group in our inventory, we can just say limit it to just node one. It'll only target node one. Or limit it to node one and node two. Then it'll just target node one and node two and not node three. So you can use limit to narrow the scope of who you're hitting. Robosity is the dash Bs. We don't have to go into all of the other stuff, but that, that's what a template, yes? Editing this? No, you said the new sleep is the one that sleeps and run with the template. Yeah. Remember, if the template is a fish, that's, that's fine. I think that's what they can do. But if they can edit the template, it seems like they can do anything with the template. They can edit the template? Um, well, I mean, why'd you give that guy edit rights? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just I'm looking at security. That's fine. So, I, I mean, manipulating this. Uh, it, they have to be a super user to be manipulating this stuff. So at, at that point, yes, they have access to it. Yeah, so, but they can't actually edit the playbook itself. Yeah, they can't edit the playbook itself. So that will live in source control. So one thing, how you want to use Ansible and Ansible Tower is you don't want the source of truth to be within this. This is only referencing everything. So the inventory is just referencing whatever the dynamic inventory is which is my AWS inventory. So that lives in AWS. This lives in GitHub. <coughs> right? Only thing that's sort of tied to here might be credentials, that's in Ansible Tower, but everything else is anywhere else. So that, it also makes it easy, if you lose Tower, you just spin up another one and just point to all your stuff and you'll have Tower back up. Yes? Can you show an example using Ansible Vault that you can use to secure variables and yes, stuff like yes. that on a much smaller scale than this? But yeah, we will go into that. Yes. So, how does so I, this is a, a challenge, a chicken egg problem I run into, and I never quite understood the good way to do it. So we've got, let's say, uh, host inventory is coming from IBM, uh, for this example, and I got a host that I need to register to IBM, that is my registered install. Not 
playbook to run all this. I'd like to run it from the tower, but how do I run against a host that does not exist in my inventory using the tower playbook? Okay, let's go into that. Um, actually, you had a question too? Uh, before you leave the tower. Yes. Again, it, I mean, you call it an enterprise host. If you're a single developer, developer who I guess mostly trust themselves not to do anything stupid. Uh -huh. I get the impression there's not much plan to go on the tower or anything like that. I guess better off to just yeah. use the original. That's fine. Yeah. And the we have the open source version of this too, so if you want to play around with it, you can. But um, yeah, this is at enterprise scale. You need to control who's running what. Uh, when I test stuff, I just do it all command line. Um, when I write stuff, I just do it all command line. Um, I was going to show something. Oh, yeah. Chicken egg problem. Chicken egg problem. Okay. So. Because it was a big one, you know, because you know, when, when people come from things like CF Engine, you know, CF Engine would go run on a host and interrogate the host and do what it needs to do. We were at a place where we were going from CF Engine to Steam Ansible, and it was definitely one of like, okay, well, I want to run my playbook, but my host doesn't exist in you know, inventory. So I don't have my single source of truth. They're used to running things that will interrogate on the host and figure out what our source of truth is based on the host, based on this host and its network segment and everything else. Uh -huh. And so it basically became a challenge and also we came to one of, well, what, how do I register a host to my inventory system that Ansible uses you know, when the host doesn't exist anywhere, except maybe in DNS? I want to make sure I'm not mixing it up. So, I'm going to show you an example of deploying something in AWS mm -hmm. and then grabbing that host to then do more stuff yeah. to that. Host. So basically, the host does not exist in your Ansible inventory. That's right. the key point of this whole thing. So, okay, so when we deploy a new VM, right, that host doesn't <laughs> exist in inventory yet, right? And then being able to <laughs> then target that VM to do stuff. That's, right. That's exactly what right. You can't use the in inventory queries to get that. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so this is where it's like the next level true automation. It's like, it's awesome. So let's start with, um, that's cool, we're not supposed to go this far, but. Uh, let, I'll actually show you AWS, this might be an easier one than Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure. So. Um, so we use the EC2 module, I love Microsoft, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, so we're using the EC2 module, so I'm, de I'm deploying a new VM in AWS right now. So I'm saying, here's a key pair, I mean if you use AWS, these will be uh, pretty easy for you to understand. Here's a key pair I want you to use. Here's an image I want you to deploy. Is the region to deploy it in? How many of those do I want? Blah, blah, blah. So we use the EC2 module to deploy a VM. Then we use the wait for module to make sure that that host comes up. And how do I know what that host is? Well, I register, I use something called register. And I put that in a variable called EC2. It could be whatever. Now this gives me all the information about what I just did. So I deployed a VM. AWS is gonna give me back a whole bunch of information. And one of that is the actual IP address or publicly accessible IP address of that node. So I say, all right, wait for that this node to be reachable on port 22. Okay, cool. Then what I do is I create a dynamic inventory during the playbook execution. So I say, add this new host that I just got into a group called new host, and now I can target this new host group. So let me show you what that playbook looks like. Does that make sense? So I make AWS call, API calls to deploy VM. I register the facts about that. From there, I get the IP address of the new node, and I create a new inventory on the fly. So this is all done in memory. So, 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 in, so in the other way in Power, if I, if I have a playbook, I basically have a survey, survey for all my information, and then from that survey information, I would then use that to then create the query for the next query. No, this would just be programmed into your playbook. Yeah, no, say, but if my playbook were to ask me for the information of Oh yeah, yeah. Point. yeah, absolutely you can do that. But you wanted to see this, right? Just, just doing it all in an automated well, my, Mine was one of you know, the use cases, hey, pull up the survey, which host do I need to register in my VM, enter all that information, Okay. And then the playbook would execute against the host that does not exist anywhere in the system. Gotcha, okay. And after it's ex executed, of course, now IDM knows about it, or it's power side IDM, it's available. Gotcha. Um, yeah, well in that case, yeah, that would be, since you're adding a host to it, then you would so I, I, told, I showed you something totally irrelevant. Well, no, but it, 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 the <laughs> workflow is the same. The workflow yeah. is kind of the same. 
So what we do now is I use this EC2 common to deploy the VM. And then this is still one playbook. So a playbook can have multiple plays. So this is a play, and this is a play. So first play is to talk to AWS and deploy the VM. The second play is to now target that inventory I just created to deploy my application. So let's go back to that one more time. So the new group is called new host. So now this is a group in memory that I can target. So my next play says, go ahead and target that new host group. This could be one node, it could be 10 nodes. And now go ahead and do all the other stuff to the nodes that I just deployed. And that's how I deployed all my stuff that I'm using today too, using this. So this is sort of like the next level thing. I mean, you can do so much stuff with this, right? It's extremely powerful of what you can do once you are able to do all this stuff dynamically on the fly. Um, any questions there? Hopefully it's cool. I, I think it's cool. Um, so Vault. Asked about Vault, right? Okay, so let's look at Vault. So if you take a look at this, obviously we don't want that password in clear text, right? That's that's a big no-no. So we can use something called Ansible Vault, and I can say create a password.yaml file. It's gonna ask for a password for that file itself, and I can say and the three dashes is just convention for a YAML file. It's just saying, hey, this is a YAML file. It's not required. Actually, I think there's three dots at the end. I've never done that before. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like it's scratched. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we can say, okay, so actually the password is answer. Now, if we take a look at the file, obviously it's going to just be encrypted garble. Um, if we want to edit that file, we give it the password to go. I don't know why this is. Um, so we go, go in and we can see that. So what's going to happen is when Ansible executes, it's going to go decrypt this file and grab the variables necessary to then do what it needs to do. So that's, this is Ansible Vault. Now, that's how we used to do it. And well, we still do it this way, too. But there's also something called encrypt string. But, but, but when you run it like that, you're, Ansible's going to prompt you for a password. Right? Yes. So you, you can have it prompt you for a password, or you can have it saved somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, or speaking of, speaking of chicken eggs. Yeah. <laughs> or um, you can have a script to go and query it if, if you want. Uh, of course, I have it in clear text somewhere. So. <laughs> um, so we used to do it like, no, we still do. We create an entire vaulted file. Now that means you have to manage a variable file that's encrypted and also a variable file that's not. Because you can have variables that don't need to be encrypted and you have another file for that. So what we have is <clears throat> something called encrypt string. And I can say Ansible. So this value is now going to be encrypted. As long as no one's looking over your shoulder when you type this, and then you clear your text, um, this is the actual value of this. So now I can reference the variable like that. So I can have one variable file with encrypted and non-encrypted values, so it's easier to maintain your variables. It's easier to troubleshoot because what the problem was when we had a different file, sometimes it was hard to track why is this errand? Is it calling me from this file or where is this variable living and stuff? This makes it easier to all manage it under one. So um, let me show you. Uh, so now I can have variables defined in my playbook. It says this is wrong. This is, I have a linter, yeah, I'm a linter. It's gonna complain, because this is, this just doesn't make sense to it, but this is correct in text. Um, I can have my secret actually be this value. I can have test be this value. And what I do is I just debug it. So in my variable file, I have another thing and I have something non-encrypted. So it's easier to maintain all your variables this way rather than having a separate file <coughs> You're free to have a separate file. You, there's still, you can do it whatever way. I'm just showing you another way to do it. So if I, um, so if I take a look at this and I run vault test, uh, it just comes back and it shows me the value. So what was the first thing? The first one was my secret. So this value here. 
came back as, that's Hello World, this is Ansible, this is the non-encrypted one, and this is another encrypted one. Though. So that's Vault, and that's um, a way to utilize Vault. Any questions? Um, I don't know what else to show you. So since we have a little bit of time, I'll go into roles. This is the last piece. Oh yeah, you can take a, you want to take a five minute break? Sure. I don't yeah, care. if anybody's new for the first time, the restrooms are down just behind the elevators. Give you a break. <laughs> I needed that break. <laughs> There's a bunch of pens out there. And stickers, yes. Yes. Um, the, like my playbook? Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can throw that up somewhere. Or I can email it to... Someone tells me where to email it to I'll email it. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can throw that up. Actually, it might live in GitHub. Yeah, it's it's here. So yeah, I'll, I'll send the GitHub link um, for AWS and also Azure. I think I have both. That's something I'm interested so you talk about the ad host, right? Ad host yeah, and the ad host and then uh, yeah. uh, red marker. Yep. That's really powerful, really powerful. Yeah, so I'll definitely make this available. Doing a similar thing with satellite and uh, deploying uh, using public limits to deploy. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. More than happy to. So now that we have people out of the room, let's talk about the most important stuff. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll give it like five minutes. We'll just start. We're almost done. So you don't have to hear my voice that much longer. <coughs> I've never done the delivery this way. This is very draining. Did you come all the way up in North Carolina just for this presentation? No, I had to come up for a customer on site, but why not? I like Ansible, so pay an extra day. Of Tower, does it contain all the features of the enterprise? Or? If not more, because you know that's how upstream works. It's AWS, uh, github.com slash ansible slash AWS. Yes, it's your Yeah. Um, oh, okay.
then that, that, that's the passion is last piece uh, and then you can enjoy your Saturday so we have something called rules and this is the one I struggle with the most to try to explain especially when you're starting off using Ansible you're not going to start here you just write your playbooks like we saw uh, so write your playbooks Like so, right, just, just write it all in, uh, create your playbook. And then when why rules come into play is as you start to build out your Ansible infrastructure and playbooks and all that stuff, you're gonna start to realize that there's some tasks that you do repetitively across all of it. So think of it like a function, right? So by creating a role, you can create a role that has a set of tasks that it needs to accomplish and go ahead and modularize that so you can plug it in wherever you want. Um, so if that doesn't make sense, give me just a couple more minutes. Um, so first step is roles allow you to share playbooks in a complete way. So if you remember back to the playbook we just ran, we had in here, so to run this playbook, Here's variables that exist. Here's my templates, here and here. So if I want to give someone this playbook, I also have to give them these templates and whatever else dependency there is. What a rule does is it has all of that included. So if I rollify this, it'll have the tasks, it'll have the templates, it'll have the handlers, it'll have everything um, in a directory structure that you can just ship and give to someone else. So how that looks like is So when we create a role, this is what we're doing. So in this case, I have a common role and I have an Apache role. So common might be a baseline role I have to do across all my systems no matter what. And then Apache would be Apache specific. You might have a MySQL specific, so on. So this playbook is going to call this role and it's going to execute all the tasks. And now what a role contains is everything necessary for that playbook to run. So our tasks will be in our task section. Our handlers will be in our handlers. It's just deconstructing the playbook into this directory structure. Our templates will live here. Our files will live here. Our variables will live here. And we have default variables as well. Lowest precedence variable, and that will live here. So 
now our playbook looks like this. Our playbook that actually, where we call the roles. So we just say, target our web group, here's the roles I want you to put on there. So it makes it easier to understand what's going on in your playbook if you start to rollify your Ansible infrastructure. Um, also, we have something called Ansible Galaxy where we have tons of roles in there. So there's pretty much what you're trying to do, there's most likely a playbook that sort of does that for you out there. So you can search in Galaxy or GitHub, bring it down, modify it a little bit, and then you'll be able to do what you want. So let's go ahead and use Galaxy to uh, bring down a playbook. Uh, so, to start off, you can use Ansible Galaxy to initialize a role directory structure. So I could say, let's call this role test. So I have test created here. So it has a directory structure for everything that's required for a playbook to run. The task, templates, you name it, all that stuff is included there. Now, uh, this goes into so much stuff. Um, does that make sense? Why you want to roll? You sort of modularize it so you can apply it wherever you want. Does that learn the value of that, I guess, when your, when your playbooks get out of hand and they're wondering if they can't apply? Yes. That's, why. That's when you start looking into roles. Yeah. So don't start off with this. There's no reason to start off with roles. Just write the playbooks as you, as you write them. And as you do more, then you're going to want to start to put stuff in different functions. Like maybe this is the baselining, maybe this is configuration, maybe this is provisioning. App deployment, you have all different roles for that. So, so are, are, there, are there each of these directories, and there's certainly the files that are right. led to these roles, split the roles? Yep. Or is that going to be really open? What, what do you mean? By, or, well, for the root of that, where all the files are to apply dot, you'll see like the YAML files. Right? Oh, yeah. So that doesn't have, I just initialized one. But, oh, sorry. But um, here, I'll, just, I'll show you an example of and if this doesn't make sense, it's okay. It's going to make sense as you use it. Um, it just took me like four months before I even started looking into rules because I was happy with the way I was writing playbooks. Um, what triggered your need to, need to do that? Just out of hand? Yeah. So, and it's also, it helps you structure how you execute things. So rather than having a playbook that does everything, mm -hmm. it helps you layer it. So if I want to, let's say, provision a server, I don't want one playbook doing all of it. I want to chunk it out so it's easier to troubleshoot, but I also want it to provision first, and then deploy applications on it, and then maybe do something, and then maybe do something. Not just flop, something goes wrong, then you're screwed. All right, so you can start to layer how you do your, uh, layer your execution. Okay, so this goes into a bit of stuff. Uh, maybe that's not stuff. Uh, let me start with this. Okay, so I have, uh, if it's hard to see in the back, I apologize. <laughs> I don't know how to make this for you. Um, so here's my roles. I have three roles. I have a, something to upgrade my router, something to tweak an access list, uh, and something to configure an interface. Let's just say I have three roles. Now, a roles directory will have to exist, and that's where your roles go into. Your playbooks will live on the same directory level as your roles. And your playbook will call the appropriate role. So, if you have a playbook that does this, uh, let's see here. So, I have a bunch of roles here, and each of these is going to have everything necessary to run. So, it's going to have my tasks, it's going to have my templates, uh, some other stuff if you needed it. So, how do I call this role? Well, I go to my playbook, and I say include role. And that rule is not included. So now, I, I mean, I do all this other stuff. You can ignore this. But that's how you call the playbook. So your actual playbook that you see that you execute is going to be that simple. And what it then does is, OK, so it's going to look at the rules folder. It's going to look for this exact directory, network VMVPN. It finds that, runs all this stuff. Now, one other thing with this is now we can talk about directory structure. So. So if you look at here, so I have my roles folder. I have my playbooks that call the roles. 
Now I can also have group bars and host bars. So now I can have the directory structure where I put these files that will reference my inventory. So in this case, if I have an all.yaml, that's a variable that goes applies to all groups. So maybe the username and password not in clear text, um, and the network operating system, for example. Maybe just for my routers, I have different variables as well. In this case, it's just password. That's really useful. Um, maybe you know, interface name is Ansible, for example. Let's just say that. So that's group bars. And then you can have host specific variables as well. So in this case, for each host, I have the actual value connecting to it. So that my inventory actually looks like this. Rather than all those Ansible hosts, all the stuff, I put it in a directory structure so that Hey, here's the host level variable for router one. Router one, this is how we're going to connect to it. Here's the operating system that's used. You start to create this directory structure as you use Ansible, and then you're going to have your roles there and your playbooks are called. So, I don't know any better way to explain this. This is really messy, but that's what you're going to, this is sort of what it's going to start to look like. But when you start off, you're just going to have these playbooks. Just regular playbooks, and as you continue to grow, then you're going to have group level variables, host level variables and then your roles. So that's sort of the end goal of what you want, the state you want to get to as a user. Hopefully that made sense. Any questions? Okay, um, I don't think I have anything else because uh, we're not gonna go into power anymore. So that's it. <laughs> cool. And then I'll um, shoot over the slide deck if you want that. There's also another, so actually this might be useful. Um, if you go to ansible.redhatgov.io, I work in public sector, so Red Hat Gov. Um, this is a workshop I built. So this is what the students would have actually gone through or whoever's sitting in. And in here, you're gonna see everything we did. So Ansible Essentials, if you look at it, exercise 1-1, one, one, we're gonna start off with some add-on commands. Right? It's pretty much everything we did today um, in the workshop fashion. So you can go ahead, take a look at all the exercises. It tells you, it kind of explains what we did. Again, if you're going to read it over. Also the decks, additional resources, decks, and you have the deck we just used, and you also have a tower deck in there as well. Ansible.redhatgov.io. Uh, don't touch these. I moved them. But Ansible Essentials and Ansible Tower. So, you're free to go in, try it all out. You can install Tower. I even have a link to a five node license, a premium license. So if you wanted to test it out, you can. Um, but yeah, so just want to leave that there. And I'll, and I'll shoot over the link to the email. Well, thank you, Gerald. Yeah. Again, you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to the Red Hat folks who came out this morning to help with the logistics of the meeting. And then our Red Hat sponsor is here. Please say hello after the meeting. Thank you, Thank you for the goodies. And she might even have some swag. Swag probably cool. Nice job. And jobs. Well, I'm just gonna get to that. Just gonna get to that. So it's, with that, is anybody hiring? Anybody looking for work? All right, please hang around and network. And finally, uh, we may have a new location here in Tyson's. Uh, just watch Meetup for more information on that. Thank you again, Joe. Yes, no problem. Thank you.